This video is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes to websites, online stores, etc., there's no place to build a beautiful online presence like Squarespace. Stanley Kubrick is one of the few filmmakers where it doesn't matter who you are or what your taste is, you at the very least appreciate one of his films. The images Kubrick creates in all his work are strong enough to burn themselves into your mind, becoming instantly unforgettable. I'm a young guy, so my introduction to Kubrick's work wasn't a Kubrick film at all. It was a parody of The Shining and some Halloween special for The Simpsons. While this is a cartoon and is significantly goofier than The Shining, I never forgot the iconic ideas that this show mimicked. What I'm trying to say is Kubrick's filmmaking went past his own films. It was a creative vision you never forgot about after seeing it. I'll bite and be the first to say it. I think he's the best filmmaker of all time. It's controversial, I know. So I want to celebrate his work by ranking all 13 of his films because that's probably the easiest way to talk about it, and it's also just harmless fun. Fear and Desire is Kubrick's first narrative feature film and is also historically hated by the man himself, once saying, it's not a film I remember with any pride except for the fact that it was finished. While I don't think it's that bad, I can't deny that this is in fact the worst Kubrick film. The pacing and narrative that usually feels seamless and unrecognizable in his work is completely scattered in this. It teeters on the line of being experimental but never actually achieves anything significant in its experimentation. Some of the performances do very little for me, and combined with the disoriented storytelling it makes for an interesting watch, but not one that leaves me feeling much at all. What I will say about Fear and Desire is that it's clear as day that Kubrick has had a gifted eye since the beginning. I mean, this is almost better looking than some of the earlier films that came after this. He's playful with how he frames characters, and this is a fantastic example of him practicing that at an early stage. I still think Fear and Desire is his worst film, but Killer's Kiss, his next film, felt just as if not more forgettable. But don't get me wrong, this is a huge improvement. The biggest thing Kubrick managed to fix was the story structure. Killer's Kiss runs a lot smoother than Fear and Desire with the added bonus of some beautiful cinematography. My issue is I just don't believe this romance entirely, nor do I see Davy Gordon as a particularly interesting character. For its brevity, it just feels like it spends more time on moments like the boxing and the action than it does on letting us get to know Gordon on a more personal level. A historical epic on Spartacus clocking in at over three hours? If you know anything about who I am, you know I was intimidated and not looking forward to this at all. Historical epics just aren't my thing. You can't deny the scope of them, especially in something like this, but that's usually the only thing I find interesting about these types of films. I haven't seen a lot of them because of this, so honestly take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I have nothing against the fan base or the films themselves, it's just a style I can't even pretend to care about. But all that said, I still think Spartacus is a good movie. As we'll see later, Kubrick clearly knows how to pace an epic and build a character through it. I felt very satisfied with everything I knew about Spartacus by the end, feeling as though I actually witnessed something significant. The battle scene is extremely well directed, the thing with the flames, absolutely stunning. Like I said, the size of this is also just something to admire in itself. For what he was given, Kubrick really turned Trumbo's script into something so real. And that's as far as my praise goes for this. Knowing this is the only film Kubrick did as a for hire gig, and knowing he had very little creative freedom makes total sense considering how lukewarm most of this feels. It's not a bad film by any means, but there were a lot of moments where knowing Kubrick directed it, it could have been something more special. The Killing is an incredibly sharp 50s noir film. It's kind of everything you want out of a film like that. I can't explain why, but the entire premise revolving around a horse race was very intriguing to me, as events like that are so unique on their own. Early on, there's this one shot of a horse on the track that Kubrick holds on, and it's incredibly hypnotizing and telling of the fast-paced tone of this film. The characters and scheme we find ourselves in for the next 90 minutes are barely in control, kind of like this horse is. I bring that shot up because it's so simple and so out of place compared to the rest of the tightly paced scenes. The rest of the film works in incredibly well and built so perfectly, but that's the moment I still think about and it really showcases how powerful a Kubrick image can be no matter how simple it is. I haven't read Lolita, so I have no way of comparing this to the book, uh, just wanted to get that out of the way. All I knew going into this film was the general controversy surrounding the plot of the film and the fact that Lolita owns cool sunglasses. What I didn't expect was the fact that this is kind of hilarious sometimes. It feels really off to say that about a film that revolves around a pedophile, but there are certain scenes and moments in here that made me laugh out loud. I definitely don't think this is done to get the viewer to empathize with whom Humbert or whom Humbert, whatever, it's a dumb name. On one hand, this film makes him out to 
to be the creep and loser he is, but near the end it feels like they're trying to get you to care about him in a way like we're supposed to feel sorry for him. Which is why I have mixed feelings on this, because while it's never not compelling and has some great camera work and has some amazing performances all around, it feels a little lost in how it wants to view this guy. It's absolutely silly to say that this is pro-pedophilia, but I just think it's a little too forgiving on Humbert's part. Humbert. What? Why did they name him that? It also feels like it's tying up certain moments a little quickly, which would make sense considering how censored this movie got because of its subject matter. But all that said, for its time and for what this is, this is a pretty great movie. Now we're getting into favorites territory, and I just want to remind everyone that I think all the following films are great. He made a lot of great films, which means that some great films are still going to be lower on this list because that's how lists work, and it doesn't mean I think they're bad films, I just like the other films more. Okay, so Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange is one of my favorite uses of production design, not only in Kubrick's work, but in filmmaking as a whole. While it takes place in a near future England, it feels completely out of this world, like a very specific nightmare. I guess come to think of it, that's what this film achieves the most, depicting something nightmarish, which is good and bad. I say bad because it tonally shifts the same way your dreams would. I guess the worst thing about this film is how it feels a little disjointed in that way. That's probably completely intentional and also necessary for the plot, but it invites me into this specific environment in the first act, loses me and takes me out for a bit in the second, and brings it home in the third. I also will be the first to admit that out of all the films Kubrick has made, this is the one where the greater meaning feels a little lost to me. That's not me stating something wrong with the film, that's me simply saying I don't get it myself and maybe in future rewatches it'll come to me. I've also read the original novel by Anthony Burgess, and I gotta say, this is one of the best adaptations ever made. There's a lot to say about Clockwork Orange, as it's one of the most unique films ever made, and I do love so much about it, but wait till you hear about these other films. Okay, I feel like I just pissed off a lot of people. Eyes Wide Shut was Kubrick's final work. Released in 1999, over 10 years after his previous film, this highly anticipated follow-up is one of his most divisive. It's definitely a lot messier than most of his most iconic films from the 70s and 80s were, and I can completely understand why something like this turns off a lot of people. But this thing is such a unique time, unlike anything he's ever done, and honestly, unlike anything you'll ever see. Knowing nothing about it going in, you really don't know where he's gonna take you, what will happen, what won't happen, or honestly, Honestly, how any of the characters truly feel about anything. What I will say is all of his work is extremely heartless and if anything an ugly depiction of us as people, attempting to strip us down as a way of exploring what it means to be a human. And I think Eyes Wide Shut is attempting to find the answers to that through sex, society's view on sex, the implications class has on sex, and the fear associated with it. I think it's definitely one of Kubrick's darker films and the confusion and hopelessness Tom Cruise's character displays throughout is immediately placed upon the viewer. So yeah, it's not a very approachable film and there's a lot of of it that you the viewer have to make sense of yourself, but no matter what you think of it, you can't deny how perfect that final line is. I've really come around to Doctor Strangelove since my first viewing. First time I saw it, I loved it, but I was really trying to figure out what I should and shouldn't be laughing at. There was an appreciation for it, but it left me wondering if I missed something. Second time, I realized it was much funnier than I thought the first time. And the third time, I realized this is one of the most clever comedies ever made. I really appreciate films like this that can take something otherwise not so funny and prove that there's actually something so ridiculous about the entire thing. Understanding how to make fun of something and know how to critique something at the same time without being obnoxious. All the performance are phenomenal, the fact that Peter Sellers plays three different characters in this thing speaks volumes. I also love how it looks. So much of this is instantly recognizable, and it shows how much personality Kubrick is able to bring to individual settings and characters just with camera work. I mean, this is easily the funniest Kubrick film I've ever seen, and seeing as though Kubrick had a good sense of humor, that's really saying something. Full Metal Jacket is one of those where you never forget your first time. Trying to put into words what Full Metal Jacket does so well is difficult because so much of what this film is doing is entirely mental. The first 45 minutes of the film, arguably completely different tonally from what follows, is some of the most perfect filmmaking I've ever seen. The slow, repetitive, deceptively humorous moments that build into something so dark and scarring for even the viewer. For a film so unsettling, the filmmaking is doing a lot to not be in your face about that. The camera work is simple, the use of music is minimal and always incredibly specific. On the outside, everything feels normal, but Kubrick plants something deeper and darker within every scene that the viewer eventually finds in themselves. I still don't think this is Kubrick's best war film, which is saying a lot, but I think Joker is one of the best characters he's ever dealt with, playing with subtlety and more than anything trying to come to terms with what it means to be normal. 
In just 88 minutes and at 28 years old, Kubrick made the best anti-war film I've personally ever seen when he made Paths of Glory. Paths of Glory isn't as playful or as colorful or as expressive as some of his most famous work, but it's without a doubt his sharpest. Without spoiling, Paths of Glory plays out in a way where it never gives you a second to breathe. The same can be said about the camera work, which showcases early examples of his signature tracking shots he'd later come to master. They always last past the viewer's expectations, seamlessly moving from one area to the next, capturing chaos and violence while in complete control. It evokes a certain emotion that you can't get with any other filmmaker. And the screenplay is probably my favorite of his, with moments that feel like a release but are inevitably grim. Kirk Douglas delivers a quiet and timeless performance that easily goes down as a best of all time for me. It's just by far the angriest film I've seen by Kubrick, unapologetically depicting the horror and eternal destruction associated with war. The Shining is definitely one of Kubrick's lesser known films. Probably never heard of it. It's got these twin girls that look like really creepy in the elevator with the- it, You know, it kind of reminds me of that one scene in Ready Player One. What I'm trying to say is you've probably seen The Shining and you also probably don't need anybody to hype it up or talk about it, but I'll touch on it a little. The Shining is one of the best thrillers of all time because of how effective it is on the surface and how much there is to unpack underneath. In my opinion, because of how well it's held up, its originality, the performances, the theories, the entertainment of it all, I think it's the best psychological thriller of all time and it's a fun time for the whole family. Barry Lyndon, man. If there's one thing scarier than The Shining, it's three hour long period pieces. Barry Lyndon intimidated me for a long time because of how long it was and knowing all the stills looked like this. I'll come clean, it just looked boring, that's the truth. But this is one of the most entertaining and one of the most gorgeous films I have ever seen. The cinematography is stunning, the landscapes, the candlelight, every shot had me completely immersed in the time period. But I also owe that to the production design and costumes. This film is rich with detail, making you wonder if this was actually filmed in that time period. It is seriously unlike any period piece I've ever seen, and I say that because that's what it is. Period piece dramas historically, no pun intended, seem to take themselves pretty serious. There are comedies that mock them all the time, of course, but no period piece that I've seen at least captures the humanity of it all, the consistency society has held onto and can still empathize with today. All of that while still staying true to historical accuracy. Kubrick, as you can probably tell, is a master of scope and telling something beyond film, and with Barry Lyndon, I feel like I witness an entire life. And that's why those three hours fly by, because this film accomplishes so much within that time. If you're like me and you've been waiting for that day to watch Barry Lyndon, make it today, or tonight, or uh, next tomorrow morning, I don't know, do whatever you want. Lastly, there's 2001 A Space Odyssey. When I was in high school, I watched the first 20 minutes of 2001 on Netflix because I had to, it's 2001, but after those first 20 minutes, even as a high schooler, I knew enough to know I should probably save this movie for a better viewing experience. So I waited, and I naturally had the chance to catch it in 70mm at the Music Box Theater in Chicago just a few years ago. Whenever someone asks me what my favorite movie-going experience is, that night is always my answer. Watching these monkeys on the big screen, immersing yourself in the sound design of it all, hearing that music for the first time, you're having the most hypnotic experience you've ever had at the movies, and that's all just the first 30 minutes. 2001 is without a doubt the most mysterious movie ever made. It gives you so much with so little. There's experimental, and then there's traditional narrative, and 2001 lands somewhere in between for me. Since seeing 2001, I've really gravitated towards work that aims to do the same as that film, where the film is aiming to tap into a more subconscious part of me rather than directly telling me what to feel. What 2001 A Space Odyssey is, to me, is something that functions entirely on filmmaking, the alteration and combination between image, sound, and performance rather than functioning on structure or, as mentioned earlier, narrative. It introduced me to an entirely new way of not only making films, but viewing them, and honestly that goes past film. I started looking at all art differently after seeing it, asking what did this make me feel before asking myself what the artist is trying to tell me. Because Kubrick isn't trying to tell you anything specifically with 2001, he's presenting ideas with a certain rhythm, juxtaposing certain sounds with images to give you enough ambiguity to pull meaning from. So with all that said, honestly, I don't need specific reasons for why I love this film so much. It changed my life, and it changed so many others, and that's enough to call it one of the best films of all time. And you know what? That's my Kubrick ranking. Hope nobody got too mad. Thanks for watching. Check out all these films and form your own opinion. And before you head out, I want to give a quick thank you to this week's sponsor, Squarespace. Now, Squarespace, if you didn't already know, is a place where you can go to build a website, build an online store. If you have an idea and you need to take 
take it to the next step, this is the place to go. They have a wide array of award-winning designer templates that'll make whatever that website is look amazing. And if you're not great at designing websites, if that idea scares you, don't worry, you're not alone. They have 24-hour customer service to help you with any problems you have. And honestly, the best part about it all is that if you go to squarespace.com slash Karsten, that's my name, you get 10% off of your first purchase. Seriously, I can't recommend it enough. I recommend everyone check it out. Thanks again for watching. Check out all these films and form your own opinions, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Oh,